since I know most people are here to listen to the panelists about their experiences. Um, two quick things. One is that USAON now has a static page on the Arabic Cover Collaborations website. I've just uh, put the link in there on the chat box. Um, <laughs> this is part one of our one of the components of our communication strategy, uh, just trying to increase the profile and help clarify the role of the organization, uh, ways that uh, different individuals and organiz organizations can get involved with US Aon activities, as well as a brief overview of our goals and processes. So when you have a little bit of free time, um, you can you can swing over to that page and and learn a little bit more about USA on if you aren't already familiar. Um, so that's one. And then the second uh, quick update, uh, Sunny already helped me out by referring to an upcoming uh, Arabic wide webinar, which is scheduled uh, for April 14th. Um, and Sandy put the link in there. With respect to that, it's built. It has been built initially, sort of as an introduction to US Aon. But um, so beyond, but it's it's a little bit more than that. So beyond, uh, again, an overview description of the organization, how to get involved, and some key accomplishments of the US Aon over the over the previous few years, um, we're also going to highlight. Uh, ideally, some some case studies. Um, different um, individuals will be presenting um, uh, the ways in which they've been able to engage uh, with the US Aon activities. And so we'll hear from uh, several, a handful of, of individuals uh, based on different types of activities that, that they've been working on, both interagency from the academic uh, community, international perspectives, uh, and one or two others, um, including uh, ideally with from indigenous organizations. So we look forward to, to having you join us if, you're, uh, if your um, schedule allows. If not, I'm sure uh, as per, per usual, the webinar will be recorded in archive for, for later viewing. So um, that's all I have for today. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Roberto. Any questions for Roberto? Okay. So now we'll move on to our early career panel. Um, as I mentioned, we've invited three scientists to be on our panel and share um, their experiences and, and thoughts with us. So I'll introduce each of those scientists and they'll give a brief um, presentation on their background, biography, and perspectives on, on observing. And then after each of them gives their brief presentation, we'll start the discussion. I encourage you to add questions for the panel in the chat or raise your hand and we will um, start the discussion after their presentations. So our first speaker will be um, Alice Bradley, who's an assistant professor at Williams College. So Alice. Thanks. Um, so uh, we were asked to provide you know, one or two slides. So this is my um, illustrated CV on a slide. Um, and my interest in polar observing and Antarctic observing especially um, really got started while I was doing my PhD at the University of Colorado. Um, so I was in the aerospace engineering department. Um, I was really interested in going to grad school to study environmental observation of some sort. I didn't really at that point care what, um, but kind of got hooked on the Arctic um, with some projects doing unmanned aircraft based sensing platforms and specifically dropping micro buoys between ice flows. Um, and so it was my work on that, that kind of shuffled me into a, um, a early career co-chair slot at the Arctic Observing Summit in Fairbanks in 2016. Um, on the technology working group of the Arctic Observing Summit at that point. Um, along with getting involved in APEX, um, first at the international level and then kind of launching US APEX um, that set up most of what I've done since then uh, with regard to observing. Um, so after, after my PhD, I uh, went to Dartmouth to do a postdoc um, where I was ostensibly building buoys, um, but then also getting involved in some work using community observations as a validation approach for satellite observations. Um, but then also at the same time, kind of getting deeper into the Arctic Observing Summit community. Um, I volunteered as a rapporteur for one of the working groups uh, for the 2018 summit. Um, and in the process of that, um, got involved into some of the kind of bigger picture strategic thinking around the roads process and how the Arctic Observing Summit um, can, can fill into that. 
At the same time, um, I was still highly involved with APEX at the time. I was at that point president of APEX um, and also a cryosphere working group fellow for IOSC. So it, there were weeks that I was doing more kind of, uh, I guess, community service and that kind of that kind of work than I was actually doing on my postdoc. Um, but that was kind of getting at some of the more interesting questions um, that at least I was I was dealing with at the time, um, which is really more more than how do we make individual measurements is how do we actually observe like what does observing look like on a bigger scale, um, and it was through the work with uh, kind of the team involved in that working group at the Arctic Observing Summit um, that I got involved both kind of deeper into the AOS um, community uh, and eventually serving in the in a kind of designated early career slot on the leadership um, and the executive committee for that, um, but then also into the um, uh, proposal writing process for the coordinated observing network RNA or co-ops. Um, so I've been an assistant professor at Williams since summer 2018. Um, I teach classes related to climate science, the cryosphere, and specifically environmental observing. Um, I've got some research projects going on in coastal ice remote sensing and some seismic detection of ridging events near shore. Um, and then also this, this big co-ops project. Um, so lots of hats, lots of simultaneous projects, um, but, but all firmly rooted in Arctic observing. Um, so I'll I'll wrap up there and, and hand off to the next person on the panel. Great, thank you, Alice. So our next uh, uh, speaker will be Christopher Cox, and Chris is a physical scientist at NOAA's Physical Sciences Laboratory. Chris, uh, thanks, Sally. Uh, yeah, so I'm a federal scientist at at the NOAA uh, Physical Sciences Lab in Boulder, and uh, I, I'd say my my career path has been somewhat more uh, meandering than what uh, uh, than what Alice has, has described as being a pretty directed path um, that she carved out over time. And um, my specialty is is measuring and analyzing surface energy budget um, in the Arctic cryosphere. So the atmosphere, clouds, the atmospheric boundary layer, snow, snow and tundra, sea ice, uh, Greenland ice sheet, um, different parts of the Arctic. Uh, interests me. But, um, so I've been visiting the Arctic and doing this work for the last 10 years or so. And over that time, I spent about a year and a half of my time there. Um, but before that, uh, I did my undergraduate at the University of Maine. And I was, uh, I, I was at the time majoring in anthropology and geology. Uh, I did some land surveying after that. So this was um, around 2006. And um, I was pretty interested in archaeology and mapping, so I was definitely interested in field data, but at that point I'd had pretty little exposure to polar research, a little bit through uh, glacial geology. Uh, the University of Maine has a pretty strong history of, uh, of ice core research, for example, in both Greenland and Antarctica, but um, not something that I was, I was getting involved with in any real, to any real degree. And when I went to grad school, I was at the University of Idaho, so this is around 2000, eight or so, 2007, 2008. Um, and I got my master's degree in, in geography there, analyzing um, uh, FTIR data of uh, basically observations of the Arctic atmosphere and retrieving cloud properties and such, which was a pretty rapid about face for me. It wasn't something I'd ever really thought much about before. Um, and it wasn't something I'd necessarily planned. I had sort of different ideas about what I wanted to do when I got to grad school. But I think like a lot of people, when you get to grad school, um, you uh, follow the opportunities. So um, you align yourself with a professor who has a project that uh, you can contribute to. And there's kind of a, seems like a more of an organic progression at that point, but it was something that I really liked. Um, so I continued working on that and sort of rolled it into a PhD. So I wasn't even necessarily at that time planning to, to do a dissertation, but I was inspired at the time. So I, uh, I pursued a PhD in environmental sciences from uh, from that university as well, and um, uh, and it, it was that time I guess when I really got started in field work. So uh, I spent some time at first at Summit Station Greenland um, about that first year. I think about four months in the winter and spring there, and 
uh, it was kind of jumping right into polar field work, I guess, but I really liked it. And I've been back to Greenland a number of times since then, also doing work at uh, the Canadian Forces Station at Alert and, and also Eureka Weather Station, both in Northern Canada and um, also research in Northern Alaska, both at Ukiarvik, as formerly known as Barrow and uh, Aliktok Point, which is part of the Prudhoe Bay oil fields. These uh, studies I, were largely connected to um, a couple international networks that were operating in the Arctic or are operating in the Arctic. One is ISOA, um, which is the international network of uh, land observatories. And the other is the baseline surface radiation network, which is actually a uh, global network of um, uh, research grade, actually kind of um, reference grade uh, radiometric measurements made for the surface for climate and uh, satellite validation studies. Um, and somewhere in there, I, I did kind of take a little detour and went to the, the Equatorial Pacific for a little while, but um, came back. And um, the last two years of my life has actually been really focused on developing, deploying, and maintaining instrumentation as part of the Mosaic Icebreaker Drift Expedition that we just finished up this past, uh, this past autumn. Um, and so I was asked to consider how I sustain this, uh, which is, I guess, kind of a tricky question. You have to kind of think back to the sort of remap the pathway that got you where you are. But um, pretty early on in grad school, I aligned myself with a, a group of researchers that uh, I was interested in working with. And I kind of targeted the lab, actually the lab that I'm working at now. So um, ultimately, I, uh, I I pursued that um, that target to completion, and um, I, yeah, I guess along the way I've been somewhat flexible and willing to work with different um, instrumentation for different purposes and learn new skills to to accomplish those tasks, which has allowed me to align myself with various projects uh, moving forward and. Um, but I don't always necessarily know what the, the next thing is going to be, um, which actually I think is a pretty good thing for me being a federal researcher in NOAA now because I, I'm fairly responsive in that sense. I, I try to read the room, if you will, and uh, and try to figure out what the next step needs to be in order to support observing in the Arctic, um, which is a, actually a little bit counter to a piece of advice that I was given in grad school that I, I actually thought was really good advice and I haven't necessarily followed it very well, which is to find something really specific that uh, you can become leading expert in and focus on that, becoming known for that thing. Um, and over time, I guess I've been more becoming more aligned to the surface energy budget and people are starting to turn to me for that. But um, it's been more of a jack of all trades approach for me, I think. Um, and that comes with advantages and disadvantages. So that's that's me. Great, thank you, Chris. And our final speaker is uh, Jesse Cremian. And Jesse is a research scientist at Colorado State University. Oh, wow, and my slides are not showing up. Um, Hazel, the background's supposed to be blue, otherwise I can't see any of the text. You can't. Do you, um, I can, I mean, I can share my screen if that's yeah, why don't you want to share your screen, Jesse. Alrighty. Okay. Yep. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Awesome. All right. Um, so hi everyone. I'm Jesse Cremian. Um, I've been an atmospheric research scientist in Colorado since late 2012. Um, originally, so it all started off with me not even wanting to come close to this path. So I was kind of like Chris, um, meandering, not very direct. Um, I originally wanted to be a medical doctor actually. And then I very quickly realized in um, undergrad that I am more of a problem solver. And I like, you know, for me, becoming a medical doctor was a lot of memorizing things at first, but I really liked my classes that made me critically think of solving problems. And that to me was chemistry. So I, um, you know, I majored in chemistry for my bachelor's degree, my master's and my PhDs. Um, I started at University of Illinois and that's where everything kind of started going down this path. So 
I was in chemistry, I really started becoming interested in the environment and climate change. And that all started towards the end of college when I took an environmental chemistry class and really learned a lot about that side of, of the science. And so that inspired me to go to grad school for chemistry. Um, at that point, I really didn't know what path I wanted to take. Um, I just know I should go to grad school for chemistry. And you know, luckily enough, I found an advisor that did atmospheric chemistry and, and, and it was really a field heavy experience for me. And so I really discovered that I loved being in the field. Um, I loved going to these cold places. So actually a lot of my work started in winter time conditions in the Sierra Nevada and California. Um, and so I really liked researching a part of climate change in these regions because I really appreciate nature and the environment. And so I wanna do what I can to help protect that and to try to understand things a little better in this place that I enjoy personally as well. And so as grad school went along, um, I had a really great network of people who I met in grad school through these big campaigns that I was involved with. And so that's how I actually started to build my network in Boulder um, was actually in grad school. So I was able to get a postdoc fellowship to work at NOAA in Boulder for a couple of years, starting in 2012. And so that's kind of where it all started down the polar path. Um, I, I always thought it was so cool. The, the researchers that went to the Arctic, they got to see polar bears and penguins. Well, not penguins in the Arctic, but um, they got to see polar bears and do all this cool ice core work. And so I just thought that was really fascinating. I never thought I would be one of those researchers. And so you know, just building a network and having great mentors at NOAA, I started to get into polar research. And then that's when I really started, you know, towards the end of my postdoc to start thinking about writing proposals. And, and so my first proposal was uh, awarded by a NOAA Arctic Research Program to do some cruise work. Um, and it was a five-year project. And that kind of, that, that led to a, a whole trickling effect of writing grants that were, you know, a little bit smaller, but then they build up over time. And so now, um, here I am at Colorado State University. I'm a research scientist three, um, and I, I just love doing research in cold places. I think it's so great. And so um, this map here is just kind of showing some research I've done in, polar, in, in the Arctic in the last several years. And so I was involved with Mosaic. I was on the first leg of that expedition. Um, before that, my NOAA work involved um, these anarcho cruises, so ice nucleation over the Arctic Ocean. Um, and that was um, an interdisciplinary, very, very cross-disciplinary effort. So that was a really cool experience to be able to be a part of a really interdisciplinary team. Um, so kind of like Chris was saying, you know, you can specialize in something. So I specialize in aerosol cloud interactions and specifically how aerosols help form cloud ice or ice nucleation. But I work mostly with physical oceanographers, I work with other types of atmospheric scientists. I work with a lot of ecologists and biologists because those things are all linked together to what I study. So these interdisciplinary um, opportunities are really cool and have been a big part of my career. Um, I've done a lot of ground-based work in Alaska um, the last several years and then have a lot of research coming up. Um, and I'm actually going to start looking into doing research in Antarctica as well. So. Um, Definitely a lot of doors has been opened and everything's just kind of grown very quickly for me over the last years. And, and I'm really excited to be a polar researcher at this point. And that's pretty much my background. Great, thank you, Jesse. Okay, I do see um, there's some questions from Kelly in the chat that I'll get to, but one thing I wanted to ask um, all of you is that it seems, um, for most of your stories, a lot of your first field work was maybe not something that you necessarily sought out, but something that was perhaps just an opportunity that came up. Is that is that true? Do you think that that um, is what kind of got you excited, just having that that first opportunity to go out in the field, or was it something you sought out? Maybe Jesse, start with you. Yeah, um, so my first field experiment, I didn't even mention this, was in Atlanta, Georgia for a month <laughs> and a half. Um, and yeah, it was just, you know, I just joined this group. My advisor was like, hey, you go into the field. So it was kind of like I was put in that situation, but that's kind of when I really liked, I discovered that I liked field work, even though it was in an urban area, probably not where I originally wanted to be, but I learned a lot being thrown into that situation and I was the, one of the only grad students there. So I was in charge of all these, you know, very, very expensive instruments. Um, 
I learned very quickly how to operate them. And, and it was really satisfying to be able to, you know, it was stressful, but it was also great to be able to figure out things myself. And, and I really learned a lot from that experience. And, you know, as going along, you know, then I started working in California and I was like, wow, I want to work in remote regions where it's cold and icy. And so that was cool. But yeah, I was not expecting the very first field experience to be Atlanta. Yep. Uh, Alice? My first field experience also didn't make my slide, but it was uh, in 2010, I was almost done with an undergrad degree in electrical engineering. And I had friend. I grew up in Alaska. I had friends who are at the USGS and they needed somebody who um, had a reasonable chance of being able to fix the weather station on the Columbia ice field. Um, and so I got the fourth seat in the helicopter, um, got a couple days out on the Columbia, um, just on like two random days that I was home for summer vacation. Um, and most of my field experience, or most of my field experiences in grad school were of a similar ilk of like, we needed somebody who could do a thing I was available to go and could say yes. Um, and so it's for, for me, at least until my postdoc, when I was kind of actively seeking that out and building that in, um, it was very much opportunistic. Great, and Chris, anything to add? Yeah, um, let's see. So I, uh, you know, like I said, I did my entire master's degree without actually going to the field. and. Um, during that time, I think I was actually, I mean, that was when I was being introduced to Arctic research and, and I was starting already, I think, to de develop kind of an identity with that. And that was a little bit of a motiv motivating factor, right? I mean, I wanted to be kind of part of that environment. I wanted to go there and see it. It was actually six more years probably before I ever got to that station where I was doing the, that work. Um, but it was part of the reason why I transitioned into the into the dissertation was the opportunity to go to Greenland for a new experiment. It was very similar, um, similar sorts of instrumentation, but this was the new deployment. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I get to go there. I mean, really, so it was a very motivating factor for me. And um, I think sort of like Jesse, she didn't finish saying it, but I think she sort of, sort of started it. See if you agree, Jesse, that um, I started working with, at first, with these big, fancy, expensive instruments that um, were developed by others. And now I'm kind of a technician working with these, uh, these instruments. And uh, moving later on, now um, uh, I'm focused more on developing my own instrument packages. It's you know, it's not necessarily developing a new instrument, but um, uh, but developing the instrumentation to make the observations that I think need to be made. That's a good point. It's a it's a progression. You don't start off like <laughs> developing a new instrument from scratch. You've got to you've got to get the the expertise working with other people's instruments first. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Kelly, I think, has a couple of questions. Kelly, do you want to go ahead and ask your questions? Sure. Yeah, I was trying to trying to think of questions while you guys were presenting. So, um, so Alice, first of all, uh, I you know I love working with you, <laughs> but something I, I do really appreciate about about your path and is your involvement in all of these kind of like governance organizations like Apex, like um, like the Arctic Observing Summit and ASSW and stuff. Um, so, what are your thoughts on kind of getting more early career researchers involved in these spaces that in my experience have tend to be um, kind of dominated by older white men <laughs> in general. Um, that's a that's a fascinating question. I could probably talk for four hours about it, but um, I, I'll start with separating Apex out from the rest. Um, Apex very much, I mean, it's early career run and organized. There is an infinite number of opportunities there. Um, but those opportunities do tend to be very early career focused, and it can have a certain amount of like a kid's table effect where whatever you do in Apex doesn't necessarily translate out. Um, where I've had kind of the most, um, the most experiences that have gotten, like gotten me distance and, and progress and career has been at those kind of um, 
governance and larger scale organizations um, that tend to have very limited spots for early career researchers. Um, and so uh, I guess did also didn't make my slide, but I was the, the World Climate Research Program, Climate and Cryosphere, uh, one of their early career fellows. There were two over the course of three and a half years. Um, I don't know if they've even maintained the fellows program um, since then. So maybe that there were two over 10 years. Um, and then uh, the IASC fellows program has five fellows a year. Um, the Arctic Observing Summit opened up a spot on the executive committee for an early career researcher. Um, Arctic Observing Summit, I will say, like when, when the meetings happen, they are a little bit more proactive about bringing in early career researchers to take notes in the sessions. Um, the challenge there is that you take notes in the sessions and unless you have the kind of great combination of uh, welcoming and open-minded um, co-chair or uh, working group chairs. Um, so in my case, Sandy and Hayo, um, and are kind of talkative and a little bit pushy. Um, you take notes, you know, maybe contribute to the report and then you're done and out of there. Um, and so I think more important than kind of early career researchers trying, I mean, Obviously, if you're an early career researcher that wants to be working in this space, like that's this is how you get a toehold in there. Um, but it's also incumbent on the senior researchers and the the more senior people um, to think about what spaces are actually being made for early career researchers. There's a lot of these organizations that you know there's two delegates from the U.S. or there's you know some number of kind of spots, and those don't go to early career researchers. They go to the senior people who are going to most represent the community, which makes sense. Um, but until there's, I don't know, a, a shadow program or something, um, there isn't, there isn't really room for early career researchers in a lot of those spaces. Can I also to follow up on that, Alice, ask about, you know, the idea of being the only early career researcher in a, in a forum or in a, in a situation, it seems like that could also be a bit of a challenge, you know, kind of the, you're the one token voice from the community or something. Yeah, um, I've spent a lot of time as that one early career voice in the room. Um, I've also came through engineering programs as a woman, so I've spent a lot of time as the one voice in the room of, of various sorts. Um, personally, it doesn't phase me, but um, for many people, it absolutely would. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think kind of the more opportunities and the more explicitly welcoming opportunities as opposed to you know, these executive committees saying, you know, why don't we have more early career people involved? Um, then I think the, the more people will be welcome and feel comfortable speaking. Sally, uh, it's Martin. Could I add a comment? Uh, yeah, go ahead. And then we'll see if Chris or Jesse have any comments. Thanks. Um, this is an interesting question. And, uh, and it reminds me of a late night conversation on, a, on the Nathaniel B. Palmer in Antarctica almost 30 years ago when I was quite a bit younger, um, bemoaning this very situation about these fossilized societies and how they were run, as Kelly rightly puts it, by tending to be gray white men, gray haired white men and wondering how, what do we have to do to, to get involved and be heard and so on. And I don't have a good answer other than volunteer, be insistent, or something, be a pain in the neck, and, or whatever. But one of the challenges in this regard, um, certainly this would be true at colleges and universities, wherever they may be, um, you know, university faculty, college faculty, nominally, um, they have a service component to their contracts. Um, but as a former member of faculty, I would say you don't get an awful lot of credit for your service. You get credit for grants and publications. Um, less credit for teaching and service comes a distant third, generally speaking. So for an early career researcher um, at a university to be um, wanting to provide, to engage in these service activities, um, there's an element of risk to it, unless you have a very good dean and department head who understands the value of this. Over. And, 
And I, I am kind of fortunate in that space and that I, I am at Williams College where A, teaching is, is actually valued and B, um, we're a very small school that tries to be a bigger player than we are in size. Um, and so we do actually get a fair amount of credit for um, service to the field and being um, kind of having these kind of sort of recognized roles um, gets it is worth more for me at Williams than it would be at almost any other university position I can imagine. Um, and, and I think that that combination has like a partly I sought out this job because of kind of that balance, but also I've just gotten incredibly lucky here. Great. Thanks, Alice. Jesse? Yeah. So of course we want credit for the hard efforts of getting and engaging early career people but to those of us, you know, it's, we're just genuinely interested in it. Maybe we don't need credit, but more just an easy way to get them involved. Some in incentives from funding agencies or just making it easier for us to be better mentors. Um, and especially those of us who are kind of transitioning from early career. So I think you had a, you guys have the right idea of like getting people like us here where we've already gone through that. We're transitioning into mid-career. Um, but I think like, People like us are excited and we can hopefully inspire people who, you know, are only a few years younger than us and they can see, oh, it's easy, it's relatively, it's easier for me to get to that point than I would have originally thought where I have to do all this crazy stuff to become an established senior scientist. So it's a nice segue into that. Um, so yeah, if there's just, I don't have an easy answer for it either, but just some way that it's easier for mentors to really become very proactive and have resources to be able to engage their students or, or people that they mentor who are younger. Great, thanks, Jesse. Chris, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, nothing to add. Um, well said, Jesse. Great, okay, thank you. And it looks like Lisa has a question. Lisa, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, when you think about the transition from graduate school to your first position, um, can you talk about the pros and cons and what our agencies might do to support um, that transition point right there? Thank you. Uh, I can say one thing. Postdocs are pretty intimidating. <laughs> they're, they're very brief. They're very competitive. And um, uh, I don't know. I know. I guess I don't know what to, to suggest. I mean, on one hand, I, I spent a grand total of I think less than twelve months in a postdoc position, and it worked out pretty well for me in the end. Um, but I, I think about the time I got my feet on the ground was around the time I realized that uh, uh, that the end was approaching really rapidly and. Um, I guess what I was frustrated with at the time was that there wasn't a very, uh, I, I, what, it wasn't totally clear to me how exactly to keep that, um, to, to roll that into the next thing. And uh, yeah, I don't know if, if Alice or, or Jesse had similar experiences. Um, my uh, so I 100% agree with everything that Chris just said. Um, my struggle to find a postdoc was uh, arguably harder than anything else I've done in my career. Um, I applied for so many. I talked to so many people. Nobody had funding in kind of relevant things at the moment that I was looking. I just like you're kind of at the mercy of timing. Um, I ended up getting a postdoc by reading the NSF list of recently funded projects and cold emailing people. Um, and one of them happened to have a budget for a graduate student that they were willing to turn into a postdoc. Um, and so I spent all of 15 months in a postdoc um, and then managed to, to get the faculty job on my first application cycle. But I was sending in um, faculty job applications from the field in Ukavik, like we get back off the snow machines and I'd run back inside and hope the internet was working enough that I could submit. Um, so yeah, the, the postdoc process is, is both brutal and very short. Yes, I will 
agree with all of that. And my path was a little different. So I was offered a postdoc fellowship, but he was like, but you have to, or a postdoc position, but he said you had to get fellowship funding to be able to work for me. So that was scary because, you know, there's not a lot of funding opportunities really for postdocs, it seems like during that searching when I was going through that process and now with me writing grants, you know, I try to ask for postdocs, but a lot of times universities want you to have students on the projects because obviously that's, you know, their thing they want people to get their degrees. And so, it, yeah, the postdoc process is definitely very challenging and daunting. So if there were, yeah, if there were easier funding avenues or more guidance for postdocs, that would be, that would be useful. Thank you. Those are great answers. I'm really, uh, it gives us a lot to think about. <laughs> Any advice for uh, what would work? I, I would say, um, so I, I guess I should clarify, my postdoc was a fellowship as well. And um, uh, two years instead of one year is, uh, would be a good place to start with that. I give you a little more opportunity to uh, uh, to um, yeah plan for the next step while also kind of integrating yourself into your current position and and additionally I mean uh, yeah in addition to to kind of figuring out what the next thing is of course you're intent you have to be productive as most talk as well so um, yeah I would say two years better is better than one year. Um, if there's kind of a limited scope on that. And that, I mean, maybe that actually works pretty well for some NSF, um, uh, you know, the, the scope of, of a lot of NSF projects. Um, I can absolutely second that longer is better than shorter. Um, the other thing that would be really helpful is just like training for PIs on mentoring. Um, like there are, a lot of people that I've worked with that kind of know how to coach someone through grad school, but once they're beyond that, like if you're not going into exactly the career track they had, um, they're as lost as you are and perhaps as lost as you are and a few years out of date on it. Um, and so any kind of institutionalized and, and widely available training on how to mentor postdocs would be much appreciated. Great suggestions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Marat has a question. Well, it was more of a comment about this postdoc discussion going on. I, I want to comment on it as a little more experienced researcher who's writing proposals. And um, I, I don't think I ever personally included postdoc in any of the proposals I have written. It's not because I do not want to have postdocs. I want to. I wanted to share that. It's because, I mean, Alice actually mentioned that from the institution, there's a lot of pressure uh, to include st students, graduate students, in every grant we write. And then on top of it, obviously, I'm a researcher, so I have to write myself in, and maybe some senior faculty. All of a sudden, you try to add a postdoc. It, if you look at the bottom line of that proposal, it becomes really scary. So it's almost like it's often a trade-off if you know, should I have a student here or should I have a postdoc? It, it's for someone who's writing the proposal, it's always, it looks like having the, a student in there, a graduate student in there seems like always the better option, even though for research or science purposes, there's been many times that I, 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 I would have preferred to have someone who who already has a PhD, who can just come in and have the impact on science immediately. I, I just wanted to put it out that in terms of the funding agencies, if you're thinking about uh, what to do, you, you have to, I think, think about how that plays out. I mean, you're, there's a lot of emphasis on education. We want students, young people, there's a lot of talk and emphasis on that. And postdoc stuff gets sort of it's really in the background and forgotten about, I think. I, mean, I think that's, I think that's what, why people are struggling, understandably. Yeah, Marat, I agree with that. Um, having writing a lot of grants, because I'm a soft funded scientist too, and I have to write myself in. And yes, it is definitely more attractive to the university and 
it seems like it looks better in your broader impacts if you have master student versus postdoc. Even though it's still an early career person, you're still training someone. It just, yeah, it's challenging because it doesn't seem like as a desired of a position to have in order for you to get your funding and to actually make a bigger impact. Thank you. Anyone else have thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, I had a, I had a couple of thoughts, Sally. Um, yeah, as a former program officer, I, I can understand the, the budgets, but I would point out that NSF has instituted now a postdoc mentoring plan that is required if you're going to have a postdoc. So they do realize that postdoc mentoring has often fallen through the cracks. That's one thing. Um, and secondly, when I was at Aon, so I fell in between Martin and, and Roberto as program officer, um, it was actually uh, not, well, legal might not be the word, but um, the, the program would not support postdocs or graduate students. But there's a whole history behind that, which Martin could probably fill in better than I could, but it's not really relevant here. Um, and I moved to sort of change that. Um, and the third point um, is that NSF should value uh, postdocs as a um, important contribution under broader impacts. As a dean, I can tell you that I do encourage my researchers to include graduate students because that's how we fund in part our graduate program. So there is an interplay there. Um, but I also encourage my faculty to include postdocs because they are worth a lot more than a graduate student in terms of productivity. Often they stay on and write their own grants and soft funded positions, et cetera. So you, you're right, there is that interplay. Um, and I guess I would encourage, um, and, and Roberto can tell us where Aon is now in that regard, but I would encourage NSF to, um, to take seriously the broader impacts in the, the postdoc mentoring plan um, and maybe even think about a, you know, a fellowship program specifically for the Arctic section, for example. Um, to encourage this, um, you know, to encourage my postdocs, because there is that pressure to put on uh, graduate students for sure. I don't want to put you on the spot, Roberto, but if you want to comment, you can. Um, I'll just say, no, I, I agree with Will. And, um, you know, there have been some changes to the solicitation for Aon. We've added a, a doctoral dissertation improvement grant specific to Aon, for example. Um, you know, Ocean Sciences now has a postdoc. Mentor, uh, fellowship program. I think there are potential conversations that, you know, something to consider for the future. Um, you know, nothing is, is publicly available at this point, but um, these types of discussions, these types of recommendations, um, I, I think are worthy of consideration. So, I'll, you know, uh, perhaps in a future meeting, we might be able to say a little bit more. Great. Thank you, Roberto. I'm going to go to Martin next, but I do want to note that we um, only have three minutes left in the hour. I don't know, Hazel, if we can run a little long if needed. I'm happy to stay on. Um, if anybody would like to, I will note that the the recording of this, this has been a really great discussion, um, will be posted along with notes uh, later this week or next week. So please do feel free to share it around. And if you have to drop off, go ahead and drop off, but I will leave the Zoom open uh, for a few more minutes. Great, thank you. Okay, Martin, go ahead. Thank you, Sally. Um, in the chat box, uh, Kelly, hi Kelly asked a question of Jesse about advice to early career researchers and maybe program managers about the proposal process. So on the subject of postdocs in proposal budgets, it, it doesn't matter where you are in your career at a university, say, but particularly if you're early career, you're trying to get established. This is a good topic for a conversation with your department head and dean and to help them understand the importance of postdocs. That Often you cannot get hired if you don't have postdoc experience. So somebody's got to step up and say, we're going to hire postdocs and give them that, that experience. They're a benefit to my project, to the department, and so on. Um, so that's, that's my little bit about uh, postdocs. Get to know your dean and department head on any subject, because they could be your best friend, even will. Um, and then one other item about... Um, the proposal process and ECRs, writing proposals, it's very intimidating. Um, and talking to a program manager, the person with the purse strings, very intimidating when you're early career. But um, 
Of course, you can talk to your fellow faculty and others to get advice about talking to program managers. And of course, there's no cookie cutter program manager. They have different personalities. Some just hate talking to researchers. Some of us loved talking to researchers. They were some of my best days as a program manager when I had a long conversation talking about someone's research and helping them shape their thoughts for their proposal. But if your early career, don't hesitate or try to overcome your hesitation to, um, to talk to program managers, get to know them, have them help them to get to know you, uh, that you're out there, this is what interests you, this is where you want to go with your career and so on. Volunteer to be a reviewer of proposals, volunteer to be, volunteer to be on a panel, get to know the agency and the program directors in that kind of fashion too. Over, thank you. Great, thank you, Martin. And as a program manager, I will echo the suggestion to not feel shy about reaching out to your program manager. I think Jesse had a response and then Alice. Yeah, sorry, I applauded at first. I'm not getting used to these reaction things on Zoom. Um, but, you know, frankly, for me, you guys are very intimidating at first. Um, it, you know, it's scary to talk to program managers when you're a young person, you're like, oh, what if they don't like my idea or blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, for me, it was really effective to have really good mentors and networks of people that I could run my ideas by first. Because, you know, as an early career person, you're so excited about your ideas. You have all these great things you want to do. And, you know, just helping and talking to someone you confide in locally or that is normally a mentor to you or just someone you can trust that has more experience, um, talking the, your ideas through them builds your confidence. And then, you know, they always tell you, reach out to the program managers, give them some, you know, brief thing, idea of what you want to do. And so, you know, it's still a scary process, but then it's nice to have a step up to that by talking to someone else first or even working collaborative, collaboratively on a proposal with someone with more experience. Um, starting really small for me was really important. So my first grants were relatively small, but you know, it kind of builds the, the baseline for getting the bigger grants and being more comfortable with talking to program managers and, 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 and building your confidence. So um, yeah, that was really important to have the mentors there to help bridge the gap. Yeah, I think a lot of it's a, a little bit of an icebreaking activity, right? I mean, I, I've never had a bad experience talking to a program manager, some, some of the folks are on this call, actually. And so it's more a matter of, uh, of getting past that perceived hierarchy and, and breaking that, uh, breaking the ice and, and making those connections. Um, I guess if I, I'll, my parting thought, I have to leave, but my parting thought would be um, if, if there's any way that as a community we can, um, uh, I, I guess, promote those interactions between early career and program managers more, uh, that's all the better for everyone, I think. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Through IRPIC and SF, the program managers often do some office hour type things. So. I had one kind of other note on the topic of early career and um, proposals um, and program managers. And that is a lot of institutions don't let early career researchers, at least up through the postdoc, um, mm -hmm. submit. Um, and so that was that was certainly my case. Um, I, I had to jump through hoop after hoop after hoop in order to be able to submit a proposal um, as a postdoc. And uh, even that the institution was extremely wary of letting me do that. Um, and, and so there's certainly some institutions that are more open to it and some even departments at some institutions that are more open to it. Um, but there are kind of some structural barriers um, with institutions also on that front. Yeah, that's like a very good point, Alice. Okay, I think we have one more. Javier, I think has a question. So I think that'll be our last topic for today. Usually, it's just a short comment, actually, and thank you, everybody, for sharing these experiences. Uh, certainly, it's not a, there is no direct path for becoming a polar scientist. I'm also an engineer and a physicist uh, working in Argentina, France, and um, Fairbanks. Uh, actually, I came here for a specific elements related to the boundary layer and fluxes. And so the comment about postdoctoral is absolutely very important. The reason is because when your file is evaluated, a faculty position, we want to see that, that you have this experience 
as a postdoctoral leading your re uh, research papers because basically it's not that you're not leading whenever you're a PhD student. However, the uh, uh, um, intervals are the mentor. You know, you have an advisor there. So, so you want to see uh, as you move transition uh, to faculty or a senior uh, uh, scientist. See, uh, that you are leading the, the, the big scientific ideas. And that's why uh, somehow, it's not that it's required, but but uh, faculty committee or high are looking into that. And that is the perspective by which they're looking at. There are others, you know, if you do a postdoctoral in NASA, at the university will like that because, you know, you have NASA connection. You, you have DOE connections, but the more, little micro uh, characteristics of uh, a given postdoctoral to be a faculty. And anyway, so more than happy to, to chat again. And I know, you know JSD as well, because we are the next winter uh, air pollution here. And so anyway, good experiment. Thanks. Thank you. I think that does bring up a little bit uh, this kind of catch 22 that we want, you know, to, to move into a a professional position you need to show leadership and it's nice to have show that you're writing proposals or papers but if your institution won't let you lead a proposal then then how do you show that leadership so um any thoughts alice or yeah, we actually are... yeah. Yeah. Okay, alice were you gonna say something oh yeah and and that I have no idea what the way around it is. I mean, I think it mostly needs to be an institutional fix um, and recognizing that that postdocs are really um, there. The, the goals for a, a person who's in a postdoc position and the way the positions are set up at a lot of institutions are kind of inherently incompatible. Um, and so I think longer, longer postdoc positions, but then also um, for the places where it is a problem changing the rules so that you know, postdocs can start to branch out on their own um, a little bit. We'll, we'll make it a more, uh, well, at least we'll make the positions kind of more reliably fit what people looking to hire people out of postdoc positions are actually looking for getting out of those spots. Uh, Lisa? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in here as the, I, I have another hat, which is the ocean sciences hat, and we are running a postdoc we just restarted the postdoc program. And the one change that we made, and I hope it will be really impactful, is that the, the student uh, applies as an individual, but when the award is made, it gets transferred to the institution and the postdoc has to be the PI. So when the transfer happens, the postdoc becomes a PI. And um, we're hoping that this will push institutions to allow their postdocs to be PIs. So um, that was intentionally um, written into the solicitation. And this has gotten a lot of attention around the foundation and other programs are picking it up. So I think you'll see more of that in the future. That's very interesting, Lisa. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And then I think Santiago was trying to say something and I know he's put a couple of comments in the chat. So Santiago, and then I think we'll have to end after that because we are running quite a bit late. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I, th I think uh, I, I'm speaking from a different, a very different research experience because, as I mentioned, I work for NASA, uh, but I've been a research scientist at NASA for almost 20 years, and I, I've been, I've been soft money and I've been project money. Uh, it's just, a, it's just a different ecosystem. Uh, but I mean, my experience has had some. Uh, um, uh, commonalities were what described here. I mean, a lot of what has been described here has been on the frame of if you're going to do a more a faculty type of or academic type of career. And what I find is in my ecosystem, we are all people who didn't choose to do that. And uh, we managed, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it was but for example, there are things like uh, really helped me at the beginning. For example, the the three-year postdoc, uh, it just really 
It was, and, and there are two stories about that. One is because he was a long postdoc, I was able to do, for example, a long summer school training at uh, an NCAR. Uh, I did that and within two years of my postdoc. And the, the core of people that I met then, we are still 27, 17 years later, we are still talking to each other. We are all in the same community. I mean, many have dropped out, but it's just that the, that's when you create those ba uh, bonds. And second is, I mean, because the three years, uh, I was able to lead and organize an international workshop. And I did it in, in Patagonia, which is, you know, out of the old places. But the, uh, but the point is that, that I, and again, and half of the people that came into that workshop, I'm still in touch with them. So is this is this at this instance that where you establish this fantastic network? You're still using it so many years later, and and again, I reemphasize having three years of postdoc was fundamental. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a really interesting perspective because I think a lot of the limits on the links of postdoc positions were actually put in to protect postdocs from being exploited as cheap labor. So it's <laughs> it's sort of a definitely a balance between. Uh, yeah between that and making the positions long enough that, that you can get something useful out of yeah. it. And, and, and the, the other point is that I share with everybody is that you, your mentor needs a HR training. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. it could be excellent scientists don't mean that they're good HR people. <laughs> I think that's quite true. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna let our panelists have the last word. So Alice, anything you want to add as a last statement? Um, I guess the, the the only thing really left um, is is going back to something that Chris said in his introduction and this idea of like becoming right, like you need to become known for that thing and like have the piece that you've carved out. Um, and in there are certainly ways in observational science to do that. And I think Jesse and Chris are really ex great examples of that. Um, looking at more kind of the structural observation side that I've worked more in. Um, that is a very, very, very hard thing to do. I think I will forever be in Hio Aiken's shadow. Um, and there are worse people to, uh, whose, whose shadow to be in. Um, but just kind of recognizing that um, there, there are people who take up a lot of space kind of at the top. And as so long as there are not um, kind of roots into that space, it's, it's going to be hard for early career and more junior researchers to ever quite get there. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Jesse? Uh, yeah, just one last thing that we kind of touched on a number of times, but having a key network, um, not just of mentors, but also people who you can count on of all different levels. So I gave the example of me doing a huge field campaign in grad school and then being able to reach out to those people later on for positions or advice or whatever. Um, that's huge. And even where I work now, I've known my supervisor for since grad school from that same campaign. So having these networks of not just your own cohort, but also people you can count on who are older and more experienced from a multiple, from an array of different disciplines and responsibilities is really crucial, I think. Um, and, you know, the it'd be nice if there were more ways to facilitate those types of networking opportunities. Like mine were lucky because they came with field work, but for those who are, don't do field work who are modelers or they do a lot of computational work, um, having those kind of opportunities are really, really key for being able to grow in your career. Great, thank you. Yeah, networks are very critical. Okay, well, I want to thank our panelists again. I uh, really appreciate their perspectives, and I really appreciate everyone who was able to stay on past our end time to continue the discussion, because I think it was really, really good discussion and really informative. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks.